And see, I'm a stoner. That's why I went to jail. Because the signs were there. You know, they had my house under observation for a year. They had my phone tapped. They had a helicopter going over my house. They had undercover FBI guys or DEA guys riding up on their bicycles. And you could tell that, you know, they didn't look like bike riders, you know. Like bike, bike riders got to look. They know how to act, you know. These guys are, you know... <laughs> didn't have to jump off the bike to stop it. And then they're all gathered up in front of my house and they're looking in there and I'm in there making bombs. That's what I do. And I'm smoking pot. And they, they called me over one time and said, what, what kind of plants are those? Bamboo. Said, yeah, that's interesting. So what are you making in there? Is it bombs? Oh, interesting. And then a few months later, they, they came knocking on my door in SWAT outfits. Five in the morning, man. Knocked on the door. We'd been partying, so I, I, I you know, I was sleeping. I, I was dead to the world. My wife woke up. Someone banging at the door. So I went down there. I looked. We got glass doors, you know, and they're always open. You never lock the doors. You can never find the key, you know. That. <laughs> So the doors are always open, and, and here are these guys in their SWAT outfits and the helmets and they got their guns. And, and being a stoner, I wasn't the least bit afraid. You know, I wasn't scared. I wasn't doing anything. You know, I'm not a dope dealer or escape criminal or anything like that. You know, and so I'm looking at these guys. They're looking at me. They look like trick or treaters. You know. <laughs> That's all I say. That's a nice costume, Sonny. <laughs> But I opened the door and they come busting in and they said, we have a warrant to search your house and take your computers and shit like that. we are running around, you know, crazy. I'm in my little Speedos. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing because every, you know, guys in the morning, you know, they get a morning hard on. You know, it's not, it doesn't mean nothing. It's just nature, right? <laughs> you know, but... So I'm there with my morning heart on, in my Speedos. And I forgot I had Speedos on. I forgot I had clothes on because now I got a warrant. Oh, God, the arrest, what? You know, what is this? I couldn't figure out what they, you know, what they're doing. Then, then they come up and they said, Mr. Chong, do you have any marijuana in the house? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Where is it? Every room in the house. <laughs> Specific. Oh, there's some in my shop downstairs. You know, it's a nice bud. Hawaiian. Yeah. Just got it. So he sends a guy down there and he comes back about a few minutes later. I can't find it, sir. I said, What kind of fucking DEA guys are you, man? Then he got defensive. He goes, Oh, we don't have our dogs. <laughs> I said, that's another thing. How come you don't have your dog? What the hell? <laughs> then my wife comes down the stairs. And she she thought it was, she was going to be on television. She thought it was, we were being punked by Ashton. <laughs> <laughs> so she comes down, all looking good. You know? <laughs> looking for the camera. <laughs> uh, and I had to tell her, <laughs> we're, we're being busted. She goes, well, for what? <laughs> and so I asked him, and he said, uh, paraphernalia. What's that? <laughs> bombs. Oh, fuck. You're busting me for bombs? <laughs> really? <laughs> Apparently, uh, there's one state in the Union that uh, made a paraphernalia illegal to ship across the state line, which is Pennsylvania, the home of the DEA. And apparently the DEA has been trying to get my company, my son's company, to sell them bombs. And they kept refusing to sell them to them because we knew, we knew that they were DEA, at least my son's company did. 
I didn't. <laughs> so, so anyway, they finally came to L.A. in person, bought the bombs, and then they said, listen, we're going to go on vacation here. Will you ship the bombs to us? We still wouldn't do it, so they had a, an undercover guy go in and get a job in the, my son's company, and he shipped it. He shipped it. Because we, it's all documented. It's all filmed there. We had all the documentation. And then they had, they've been following me for a year. And I was in Arlington, Texas one time. And they got the, the DEA camera on me. And it shows the workers in the, in the head shop all wearing DEA t-shirts. And they kept standing next to the DEA officers. Wherever they go, they stand next to them. I still didn't catch them. <laughs> I, they're wearing headbands that didn't fit. I remember because they said to me, uh, Mr. Chong, can we talk to you outside? No, they're hippies. No, no. I said, sure. We go outside, we're sitting there, and he's got his backpack and the camera, and he's got to go around so he can see me. And he said, now these uh, bongs, they're not just for tobacco use only, are they? And I said, no. They're for pot. <laughs> can you repeat that? Yeah. They're for marijuana. Pot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I still didn't know. <laughs> you see, because when you don't do anything wrong, you gotta be honest. You know. And you say, oh. I go to court, and I think, well, fuck, I'll bust this, you know, because he can't bust you for bongs, you know? And I go to court, and then they sentenced me on 9-11. 9-11. And that, that's when I started waking up. I said, hey, just a minute. Why that day? And then Bush went on TV and said that, you know, the, the, the bong industry has been supplying money to the terrorist organizations in the tune of billions of dollars. And I'm thinking, well, fuck, I wish I had got some of that money. And we were in debt for half a million bucks at the time, just trying to get the bong business going. So they sent me to nine months. And I tried to, you know, talk my way out of it. <laughs> But again, the stoners, man. Oh. I try to explain to the judge that I'm, I'm really sorry and that I've been working with kids, you know, trying to, you know, keep them off drugs. Well, I've been teaching kids salsa. And the judge kind of looked down over his glasses. You know, the judges with no rims on their glasses, you know that look? And they would look over at you. And he said, salsa? And he said, yeah, well, and this is my theory, you know, when you're dancing salsa, you can get high and dance at the same time. So, which in itself is a lie, because I can get high and dance salsa. But I was trying, you know, I was giving it a shot. And then I started thinking about it. Huh? I've never been to jail. It's kind of fun, man. And I've been prepping for this, you know, all my life, because when I was a teenager, you know, 15 years old, uh, I met this biker that never had, he just got out of jail, and had no place to stay, and I said, yeah, you can stay with me for a while, so he, he moved in, and he gave me a biker, uh, my OG tattoo, a jailhouse tattoo. Now, I was really proud of this until... I found out in jail, it's a white supremacy tattoo. Because <laughs> the biker that gave it to me, he only knew two tattoos. And this is one of them. But I was going to get a change in my son said, No, Dad, that's an antique. No fuck with that. <laughs> Because I was treated like a celebrity. <laughs> Vanity Fair sent a limousine to take me to prison. I walk in, they handcuff me, and uh, just formality. And 
And they apologize. I'm sorry, Mr. Chong, but we have to handcuff you. It was know, just a formality. And I walk in the door and I got on cuffed. That was the last time I had any handcuffs on. And then I went in, in into the dormitory where I, where I was going to be living. And this guy met me. He said, took me to his locker and opened his locker. He says, anything you want, man. You know, welcome, welcome to the um, unit B. <laughs> And uh, yeah. I, I, I'd like to go back to visit. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.